हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू दी हायर मॉड्यूल ऑन इंस्टीट्यूशनल मैनेजमेंट फॉर आंटरप्रेन्योरशिप वी आर इनटू द यूनिट नंबर फाइव व्हिच इज ऑन बिजनेस स्टार्टअप्स दिस इज पार्ट थ्री ऑफ दिस यूनिट एंड दिस इज ऑन इंडस्ट्रियल लॉज इन इंडिया इन दिस वीडियो वी शेड डिस्कस टू एक्ट्स वन इज द इंडियन पार्टनरशिप एक्ट नाइनटीन एंड सेकेंडली द एम्प्लॉयज प्रोविडेंट फंड एंड मिसलिनियस प्रोविजन एक्ट नाइनटीन so first let us take up uh, the indian partnership act 1932 well uh, section 4 of the uh, act defines partnership as partnership is the relation between persons who have agreed to share the profits of business carried on by all or any of them acting for all the act also explains that persons who have entered into partnership with one another are called individually partners and collectively a firm this act was last updated in 2019 now how the partnerships are different from the business uh, entities a partnership like a sole proprietorship is legally and financially inseparable from its owners profits and losses may be passed through to the owner's personal income for tax purposes debts and liabilities pass through as well partnerships are generally easier and less costly to create than the corporations now let us discuss uh, different types of partnership so first is the general partnership a general partnership is the most basic form of partnership in most cases partners form their business by signing a partnership agreement ownership and profits are usually split evenly among the partners they may also establish different terms in the partnership agreement in a general partnership all partners have independent powers to bind the business to contracts and loans each partner also has total liability meaning they are personally responsible for all the business debts and legal obligations general partnerships are easy to form and dissolve in most cases the partnership dissolves automatically if any partner dies or goes bankrupt generally partnership is further bifurcated into two categories first is partnership at will uh, usually when a partnership is created it is upon the partners to decide till what time they want the partnership to exist hence whenever a partnership is created without a specific time limit of its closure it is termed as partnership at will the second is particular partnership this is a type of partnership that is created with an aim to carry out a specific project for example a partnership for the construction of a building or partnership for producing a movie the second type of partnership is uh, based on the partnership registration status the partnership act does not mandate the registration of partnership firm both registered and unregistered firms are valid and recognized under the law now first let us talk of the unregistered partnership firms an unregistered partnership firm is established by execution of an agreement by the partners the unregistered partnerships firms allow the partners to carry on the business in a manner indicated in the agreement second is the registered partnership firm the partnership firm uh, to be uh, registered with the uh, registrar of the firms having jurisdiction over the place of business of the firm the registration application involves payment of a registration fee to the rof rof is registrar of firms it varies from state to state according to the state law the registered parties partnership firm is preferred in many cases due to the benefits offered by a registered partnership firm the third main type of partnership is the limited liability partnership or the llp a limited partnership unlike general partnership is a corporate form of business organization 
here the liabilities are limited to each partner according to their agreed contribution to the business. The personal property of a partner cannot be attached to pay back the firm's debts. This hybrid organization is governed under the Limited Liability Partnership Act 2008 and not under the Partnership Act. Now let us uh, discuss uh, regarding the different types of partners. So first is the active or the working partner. Uh, this is a partner that is actively involved in the management and other important functional aspects of the partnership firm. He has unlimited liability in case of debts. He can even withdraw the remuneration from the firm subject to a clause in the partnership deed. The second type is a dormant or the sleeping partner. Well, as the name suggests, a dormant partner is the one that is not interested in the daily management or functional aspects of the partnership firm, but he may be consulted while taking major decisions for the firm. In case of a debt, he is liable to clear it out on behalf of the firm. The third is the nominal partner, a, a person who does not have any real interest in the business or working of the firm nor he has any right in the profits is called as a nominal partner of a firm. But he is liable to the outsiders as an actual partner. He just lends his name to the firm so that it could take advantage of his reputation and name. A nominal partner is treated like an actual partner. For example, a partnership can be executed with a celebrity or with a business tycoon for promoting a brand. Next is a partnership by estoppel or by holding out. If a person expressly declares by his words or conduct that he is a partner in a firm, then he would not be able to back out from it later. Hence, such a person would thus become liable to the third parties in clearing out the debts of the firm whenever a situation arises. Next is uh, the partners in profits only. In certain situations, a partner joins a partnership firm with the clarification that he would share only the profits as a partner and would not be liable for any losses. However, he shall be liable like all other partners since the liability of the partners is joint. Next is the sub partner. When a partner agrees to share his profits derived from the firm with a third party, that person is known as a sub partner. He cannot represent himself as a partner in the original firm. He does not have any rights against the original firm, neither he is liable for the acts of the firm. He can claim the agreed share of profits from the contracting partner only. Next is a minor as a partner. Partnerships are created by a mutual agreement between two or more parties, which is a contract. Minors are incapable of entering into the contracts. But under the Indian Partnership Act, a minor can be introduced as a partner as long as it is only to enjoy the benefits. A minor partner has access to the accounts of the firm and is entitled to share his profits. Private property of the minor cannot be attached by the creditors. Now let us discuss uh, the nine characteristics of a partnership firm. The first is existence of an agreement. This agreement may be oral or in writing. The Partnership Act 1932 section 5 clearly states that the relation of the partnership arises from the contract and not from the status. So there has to be a contract either in writing or verbal. Number 2 is existence of a business. Partnership is formed to carry on a business. The act states that a business includes every trade, occupation and profession. Business of course must be lawful. The third characteristic is sharing of the profits. The purpose of partnership should be to earn the profits 
and to share it. In the absence of any agreement, the partner should share the profits and losses as well in equal proportions. Sharing of profits is an essential condition but not a conclusive proof of the existence of partnership between partners. In some cases, persons do share the profits but they are not the partners like a lender of a money or an agent or a servant getting remuneration or the widow or child of a deceased partner or a previous owner or a part owner of the business. The uh, fourth characteristic is the agency relationship. The partnership business may be carried on by all or any of them acting for all. Thus, the law of partnership is a branch of the law of agency. To the outside public, each partner is a principal, while to the each other partner he is, a, is an agent. It must however be noted that a partner must function within the limits of the authority conferred on him. Fifth characteristic is regarding the membership. Uh, the minimum number of persons required to constitute a partnership is 2. The act however does not mention the upper limit. So, there is no upper limit regarding the partnership as per the act. For this, a recourse has to be taken to the Companies Act 1956 which is section 11.1 and section 11.2. It states that the maximum number of persons is 10 in case of a banking business and 20 in case of any other business. Uh, the sixth characteristic is regarding the nature of liability. Uh, the nature of liability of partners is the same as in the case of sole proprietorship. The liability of partners is both individual and collective. The creditors have a right to recover the firm's debts from the private property of one or all partners, hence the firm's assets are if the firm's assets are insufficient. Seventh characteristic is the fusion of ownership and control. Well, in the eyes of the law, the identity of the partners is not different from the identity of partnership firm. As such, the rights of management and the control vest with the owners that is the partners. Eighth characteristic is regarding the non-transferability of the interest. Well, no partner can assign or transfer his partnership shares to any other person so as to make him a partner in the business without the consent of all the other partners. And the last characteristic is regarding the registration of the firm. The registration of a partnership firm is not compulsory under the act. The only document or even an oral agreement among partners required is a partnership deed to bring the partnership into the existence. Okay. Now, let us go to uh, the next act which is the Employees Provident Funds and Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1952. The act provides for compulsory contributory fund for the future of an employee after his retirement or for his dependents in the case of his early death. It extends to the whole of India and is applicable to every factory engaged in any industry specified in Schedule 1 in which 20 or more persons are employed. Number 2, every other establishment employing 20 or more persons or class of such establishment which the central government may notify. Number 3, any other establishment so notified by the central government even if employing less than 20 persons. The central government has to give at least 2 months notice to such establishment. The uh, contribution uh, from the employers and towards the EPF although will continue to be at the rate of 12 percent. Uh, additionally, the government has proposed to contribute 12 percent of the wages of new employees towards the EPF, where this percentage may keep on changing from time to time. Uh, the scheme is managed under the aegis of Employees Provident Fund Organization known as EPFO. So, I think uh, that is all regarding uh, these two acts. Uh, for more details, you can refer to the e-content which is given as a part of this MOOCs. Thank you so much.